here to talk about how to buy a home in this kind of weird, crazy moment of the market. Talk about some of the headlines you may have been seeing, some of the news, and how to kind of navigate all of this right now. Uh, so to start, uh, you know, again, I'm Jeff. I am a licensed real estate broker. We run a team of four great real estate agents here in the borough of the Bronx. And I'm the mainly the person out on the street doing the showings and taking you out on showings. We'll talk about what you do a little bit. And I do uh, most of the marketing for the team and run the, our team operations. Um, I also work uh, mostly on the listing side, uh, doing the photography, the graphic design, the marketing, uh, advertising uh, for your listings. So after you buy, when it's time to sell, you'll be dealing with me a lot more. Uh, I want to talk about uh, and introduce uh, Christina Shaw. You want to tell us a little about who you are? Hi, good evening. I'm Christina Shaw. I own an insurance agency for, don't tell anybody, 26 years. Wow. And I look forward to giving you some bits and pieces on how to buy property insurance. All right. Next up, we have the wonderful Melora Love. Hello, everybody. My name is Melora Love, and I am a senior loan originator with Cross Country Mortgage, the third largest lender, everyone in the United States of this great America's. Uh, here we are. I've been in the industry. Christina, you have me beat by two years. I've been in the mortgage industry 24 years. I know I don't look it. <laughs> I know. Thank you for saying that, Aaron and Jeff. I know you were thinking That's that. Right. Well, I <laughs> and um, and I just joined Cross Country Mortgage not too long ago. It was the, the best pivot I've ever made in my life. And I think that's really it. Uh, by the way, it's going to be a rare thing to meet anyone who's been originating mortgages for 24 years. The life expectancy of a loan officer is five. I have stamina of steel, everybody. I'm in it to win it every day. That's some real deep experience. And talking about a lot of deep experience, let's turn over to not Oliver, but Jay Zentner. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what career has greater longevity, a mortgage broker or an NFL running back. <laughs> <laughs> so if you can be doing it for, you said 24 years, Malora? 24 years, Jay. So I think I've beat the running back. And you, you certainly have by five times. And Christina with 26 years, that's amazing, um, guys, uh, to do anything for that long. Um, I've been lucky enough, I guess, to be the, the junior member of this panel. I've only been doing what I do for 20 years. Um, I was crazy enough to hang a shingle just out of law school, thinking I'm either going to make it or I'm going to fail. But one way or another, this was my approach. And here I am 20 years later. I'm able to help my clients buy and sell property in and around uh, the tri-state area, actually. Um, I am not myself licensed in New Jersey. Um, but I have an attorney who I work very closely with who helps me there. I can handle transactions in Connecticut and New York. But for purposes of this panel, I am focused on the Bronx because the Bronx <laughs> is it. on fire. It it's is on wonderful. Fire. It's a great secret little mysterious little cove just up north of where I'm sitting. And I think it's amazing. I'm looking forward to talking about it. All right. We're excited to be talking about it with you guys. Um, to start, I kind of want to jump in with talking about the market right now and at least from an anecdotal perspective what we've been seeing things have been busy we're seeing a lot of showings a lot of inquiries on properties but we're not seeing that conversion rate into contracts quite as quickly as we have seen in previous quarters whether that's a factor of the current mortgage rates, which Malora will talk to us a little bit about later, or if it's a factor of the you know, limited inventory that's on the market, what we're seeing is, especially in the vertical housing options, the co-ops, the condos, things are sitting a little bit longer. Right outside of the Bronx in Westchester County, any single family home seems to be jumping off the shelves for about $100,000 more than they're asking. Bidding wars are back. So been crazy in Westchester. Westchester County has been quite busy, whereas in the Bronx, there's definitely some bidding wars for appropriately priced properties, but things are a little bit slower and there's still opportunity here in the Bronx. We are starting to see for some of the inventory that's hung around from the holidays and earlier in January, February, we're starting to see some price reductions as the spring market's looming. And that's not uncommon this time of year for people who are 
have been on the market and sitting a bit to say, okay, it's time to drop before the new inventory hits. We're not sure how much new inventory is going to come, but there's always an expectation that this time of year, more people want to make their move as the spring selling season gets kicked off. Obviously, the elephant in the room in any real estate conversation has to do with the National Association of Realtors changing their guidelines. Now, just to start, I'm not an attorney. And their proposed guidelines. So we'll see if they actually go into effect. That was the first thing that I was going to mention. The DOJ has <laughs> approved these guidelines. So all of these conversations are kind of only going to be as relevant as the DOJ ends up deciding. But I think it's important to be out in front of it and talk about what we think about it, what it means, what we've heard, and what we think the impacts will be. Um, to start, and as a kind of broad overview, in the beginning of this year, the Universal Co-Brokerage Agreement, which is something that the Real Estate Board of New York, the governing body for real estate in New York City, changed to what we call decouple commission. We talked about this before, where in the past, the seller's agent would tell a seller, we're going to charge you 6%. We're going to split that 50-50 with any buyer's agent. Now we're making two separate offers, a, an offer from the seller to the listing agent and an offer from the seller to the buyer's agent. That was the change that the Real Estate Board of New York put into place in January. And that was in uh, relation to what was going on on the national stage with the National Association of Realtors. What has just changed was this decision by the National Association of Realtors to no longer allow the advertising of buyer commission on the MLS. Doesn't mean you can't offer a buyer commission, it just can't be on the MLS. So all of this is just kind of a semantic change, but what does it do? And what are the biggest impacts of it? One of the biggest impacts is that not only do we not have the ability to advertise this buyer commission, but we're now expected to always have buyers on an agreement with us before showing them any properties, which frankly is a good practice both for working with clients and keeping yourself safe as a real estate agent. Generally speaking, you should be getting your buyers onto an agreement with you. So there's an understanding of the service you're providing them, as well as the expectations of what your payment is going to be at the other end. We all but do it's this more for, so a benefit for the buyer. It's absolutely a benefit for the buyer. You're making a commitment to us so we can make a commitment to you. Yeah. And in the same way that if you were to call up Jay and engage his services as an attorney, you'd likely sign an engagement letter. This is similar. Except we don't charge a retainer, Jay. Uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe we should, should right? Yeah. So that's one of the biggest changes. It's this expectation of putting you on an agreement with an agent. And a lot of buyers may say, well, wait, I don't want to sign an agreement with a stranger. That's crazy. Well, I tend to agree with you, which is why I think the agent relationships are going to become so much more important moving forward. Having the agents who you know, like, and trust, someone who you've spoken to and believe that they're actually knowledgeable and are looking out for your best interest. Kind of what we're trying to do here a little bit to show you that we care about our clients and we want what's best for them. And you should be able to find somebody who you can trust through your network or whether it is you follow them on Instagram for a while and go to a Google, YouTube, uh, home buyer seminar thing. Is that good? <laughs> sure. Yeah. That's great branding. Uh, that goes straight into uh, Melora. What's the, oh, yeah. what's the interest rates looking like right now for buyers? Let me tell you something. I'm having the best time, and people are also very aware. So the highest I locked in, just, y'all, you know, we're only in the first quarter of 2024. Mm -hmm. The last quarter of the fourth quarter of 2023, rates were in the 8% for loans 700,000 and under roughly, just a round number. Uh, today, you could probably get it around 6.625. So we have seen in just a very short time, a beautiful drop in interest rates. There's, so I'm, I'm feeling optimistic. I can tell you, I've seen a lot of people. There's a lot of activity. There's a lot of people getting pre-approved. There, there's a lot of excitement now because the, the rates are where people feel that they 
they're not so bad that they can afford the payment and make an offer and move forward. Uh, there's a big Fed meeting tomorrow. They're not expecting it to really have any volatile impact on rates. So I feel like we're going to have some stability through the rest of this quarter and into this second quarter of the year. So I'm not seeing anything dramatic about to happen and everything's going to be pretty flat. And we've been given a gift in a very short amount of time for rates to be dropping about a 0.38 in, about, in, in less than three, really three months or two and a half months. So rates are looking great. And as I always tell everyone, everybody, rates are a dating game. The key is everybody fall in love with the house and date the rate. Everyone who's locking in rates right now are locking in short-term mortgage products with the lowest interest rates, not paying points, which is a fee that you can pay to lower the rates more. People are banking on refinancing in a year to two years. So just get the lowest rate. Don't pay for anything lower if you feel that you're going to be in the home and want to take advantage of reset refinance, but just get this home before Jeff mentioned the bidding wars are back in and you waited for rates to fall and now you can't get the home because five other people just outbid you. So the time is now guys, it's the time is now the wave is, the tide is turning. I think that's a really apt point in this market. You know, there's a lot of conversation around rates and buyer sentiment being about around waiting until rates fall because then affordability will be easier. But there are so many people having that conversation and there's only so much inventory. We already have an inventory shortage. So if everybody who's been on the sidelines jumps in the second we get below six into five, and, you know, five and four eighths or whatever it is at that four eighths, I know I saw you laugh at that. Uh, <laughs> you know what I was going, you know what? I, I believe in any math that you give Jeff, you know, everything I, I heard it come out of my mouth and I was <laughs> like, that's not how math works. I heard it come out. Uh, but you know, when, once that rate drops to a point, the so seven eighths, right, right below, uh, b below six, suddenly people are going to jump out of the woodwork, and we're going to be dealing with price increases, um, and especially compounding with this expectation that sellers may decide to stop offering buyer commissions altogether. That's only going to compound to be a higher closing cost for buyers, because I've had a couple people say to me that their expectation is this is going to lower prices and sellers are going to adjust downward for the 3% difference. I don't know any seller who's looking to adjust their price downward to accommodate for closing costs. I think that we're more likely to see sellers do concessions than anything else or see mortgage products start to appear where they can wrap that commission into the mortgage. I think that was is probably a more likely uh, situation than seeing any kind of price decrease. But I want to jump in from here into kind of the, the, an overview of the buying process. You know, all of us on this panel have our role in the buying process. And I like to kind of go over it from a macro view so that you can get a sense of what you can expect from start to finish. And generally, what I would say is your first step in that process is identifying your real estate agent. <laughs> So we found those. in theory, you've done that first step and we're really proud of you. If we're not in the right market for you, that's okay. A big part of what we do is network with agents all around the country so that we know people who we can send you to. A big part of what's important to us is cultivating relationships with people who we believe we can send our family and friends to and know in our hearts that they'll be taken care of well. Absolutely. So whether or not we're the right agent in the right market, or you're looking for a lead somewhere else, generally your first step is to get in touch with a realtor. The reason is we're usually the most in touch with the market trends, what's going on, inventory, availability, demand, etc. Getting in touch with us will give you a good starting point for what you want to know about where you're going. Especially on the local level, like we are in and out of houses every day in our local markets and dealing with buyers and sellers really every day. We have the pulse of the market before the newspapers do, before the data even shows what's really going on. So it's really important to get in touch with us as soon as possible. Most data is looking at the past. Past usually is generally referring to closed deals. We are not looking at the past as much. We're talking about what we are doing on a day-to-day -day basis. We're dealing with people who haven't made decisions but are thinking. We're having conversations, getting an understanding of who's coming to view property up here. 
because everybody who comes into our open house gets asked, where are you coming from today? And why? With that in mind, once you have your agent, the next step would be to get pre-approved if you're thinking about doing a loan. And even if you're not thinking about doing a loan, I would say it's a good idea to talk to a lender. There are a lot of reasons to say that I want to do an all cash purchase, especially in this market. But there are also products out there that you'd be surprised about that you can leverage to your favor and potentially put in an even stronger offer. And I think Bomora has a few of those at her new uh, company, right? I have a few what? Products? Uh a few good products that uh, oh, listen, uh, a big bank. how about 196 of them? How about 196 of them? There you go. That's what I'm talking about. I don't think a big bank like Wells Fargo would. Uh, and how well, about a nimble team is important, right? Nimble. That's what my name is, Melora Nimble Love. <laughs> there you go. And, and that's why we like to work with these fabulous people, because when I need something, I know that if I need something from Melora, I can get her on the phone in five minutes. And the same thing with Jay and the same thing with Christina. If I need something, they're there for us. And that's what is important about having a good team. And that's also why I highly recommend you start with your realtor. Because as much as I love Melora and she can do a loan anywhere in the country, there's something to be said about working with your agent's lender and working with the person who's going to handle your transaction and make sure that you're in good hands along the way. You want to work with their team. And Melora is wonderful all over the place, but their team is the one who's going to get you to the finish line. The same thing goes for their attorney and potentially even their insurance person if you're looking at a different market. With that in mind, once you've gotten yourself qualified with your agent, you've talked to a lender, get your pre-approval letter, it's time to pretty much start your search. And this is the fun part. This is the shopping part, right? You get to start looking at things. We get to hang out together. We get to judge people's choices on paint color. It's all kinds of fun. We're going to go. We're going to see the market. Generally, the way I like to do it is to give you guys a sense of what your options are and let you select from those options the few you'd like to see we set up a day of tours we see three to five units and then we talk about how we want to approach the next steps generally that's been an enjoyed project project and process and has led to a lot of very happy buyers once we find a property that's right for you we make an offer we're here to help you figure out what that offer might look like and before we make an offer in this changing commission world We'll always let you know if we're working with us as a buyer, what your commission for us might be. Many times the seller is going to pay all or a part of the commission. And we're always going to let you know before you make an offer. So that's a part of your consideration and the kind of offer you're building. Once we make an offer and it's accepted, at that point, we start jumping in with inspections and start detailing our contingencies as part of that offer process. What if it's not immediately accepted? Jeff? Oh, if it's not immediately accepted, well, that's it. We go home. <laughs> no, of course, <laughs> there's, there's a back and forth. We either have opportunity to negotiate and, you know, no is never really no in real estate. It's come back and try harder. So if we're not finding that we can win in a negotiation, there are only a couple options in front of us. Either we go find another property that's right for you, or we start talking about the levers that we can pull that are attractive to a seller. There are only so many of those, like waiving contingencies, adding cash, uh, timeline, um, things of that nature. But generally, I like to ask the buyers I work with and any of you who are watching this online and maybe have already started working with us, you've probably heard me say this to you. At what price are you willing to lose? If I call you in three months when this is closed and told you that that property sold for X, at what price are you going to kick yourself and say, dang, I should have bought that? That's the question we work with because it's not about what we think. It's about what you think. It's your money. I can't spend it. You might say 900 is the absolute tops you're willing to pay for the property. But if it was 925, are you going to be upset if you didn't? put that 25 in? Are you going to kick yourself in six months when you can't find anything you like as much as this property? And there's no right answer either. Once we have an accepted offer though, mm -hmm. then usually we get there pretty quick. <laughs> so once we have an accepted offer, we begin pretty quickly the process of ensuring that it's a safe investment. And that kind of happens in two different ways, depending on the type of property. 
If we're dealing with a single family or a multifamily home, we want to get an inspector into the property pretty quickly. The inspector comes in, they're going to put together a laundry list of anything and everything that could be wrong with the home. And you're going to look at that and have a mild panic attack and then realize that most of it is just kind of as expected in older homes. Normal wear and tear. And then in a co-op or condo, this is where your attorney really starts to do the heavy lifting. So once we have that accepted offer, essentially your agents are going to put together a deal memo. A deal memo will simply outline the offer that it as exists and agreed upon. And then we send it off to the attorneys because in New York, you can't do a real estate closing without an attorney. So Jay, talk to me a little bit about what happens when you get a deal memo and, and what that process looks like. So as soon as I receive a deal memo from you guys, if I'm lucky enough, um, it means that you've probably introduced me, sung high praise about me and my firm. And I've had a communication uh, of some sort, whether it be an email or a conversation as to my role in the transaction. And the panelists here who have known me for quite some time will relate to what I'm about to say. They've heard me say it and they may chuckle, but I'm a deal maker, not a deal breaker. When I get a deal sheet in as an attorney, my job is to protect my client from things that might be hidden from them, but not talk them out of or talk them into walking away from something. When most transactions that I'm involved with, there's cures for everything that comes up. For the most part, in my experience, if I work with agents who are as good as Aaron and Jeff, that know that they can get into the management companies or they can get to the seller side to discuss what may or may not be feasible before a closing takes place are all of the ways in which I work with my clients and my agents. But basically what Jeff is asking is what happens when a deal sheet comes to me. I do two things. I make sure that the other side knows that I'm ready and willing to accept a contract from the seller side. And I'm gonna begin to reach out to management and whomever else I need to reach out to, to establish myself in the transaction and to request due diligence documents. Those due diligence documents come in multiple forms. Condos are starting to act and behave much like our co-ops do, surprisingly. There are minutes to be reviewed. Uh, minutes are the meeting notes that are taken by the secretary of boards that run and operate the buildings in our city. You match those with the financial details and the documents that we will receive from either the listing agent or the management company, and you start comparing notes. Now, there's no way for me to know whether or not a building is being run efficiently or smartly or wisely or whatever ad adjective you want to use. I use my agent's insight, my client's insight, and the experience that we have looking at certain things and comparing and contrasting and trying to determine, is this a smart investment? Is this building being well run? And so on and so forth. So that's what my job is. I'm negotiating contract terms while reviewing due diligence documents, and hopefully everything will come together. And if not, we can fix those things prior to signing a contract. But Jay, so, one so thing I think about your firm is, is your lightning speed, because you know time kills deals. Absolutely. Yes, thank you. Yes, I do try to get my deals done. If I have the cooperation of others, between five and seven business days of receiving a deal sheet. So as long as I have the cooperation, we can move through due diligence, we can review what's important, we can get in touch, hopefully our clients are available to have a conversation with us. They normally are. This generally is a big concern in their life. They're you know, about to buy uh, or go into contract on the biggest investment of their lives. And so as long as we have everybody working together, we can get through that very, very quickly. And I know the clients and agents appreciate that, who have worked really, really hard to find the right deal. And they don't want any more time to pass than is necessary because that next best deal comes in and you've lost everything that you've wanted uh, for yourself. So yeah, we are very focused on that. So what are some of the pitfalls that you look for in, in the due diligence, you know? Uh, Cause you, you say you're a deal breaker and deal maker, not a deal breaker. <laughs> and that, I, I of course love that, for, but for, for for the the buyers out there who are kind of concerned that you know they want to know that we're they're being protected right as much as they're happy to have the deal done you know what, what are you looking for that you might say to a buyer hey think twice yeah so if i thought you know we we recently had a, a transaction where there was some leaking coming in from the facade um we've had uh a couple of deals recently where there's been some noise violations 
some uh, neighbors who have been disorderly and lawsuits had been started. Um, there have been issues with not having the financials to support capital improvements that the board felt were necessary. So they had invoked an, an assessment um, to all of the unit owners or shareholders in the particular property. So what I do when I see those things is I let my clients know that there is this red flag. But all of the things that I just gave you examples of are things that can be fixed with another good negotiation effort, either through the agents or through the lawyers. I like to rely on my agents because they're the ones that are usually closest to the situation. They're the ones that have poured their blood, sweat, and tears into the initial business terms. So I don't like to get in the way of that unless they ask me to. But everything can be dealt with either in a closing credit, a fix before closing, or something else that will make the purchaser more comfortable either accepting the fact that there are these red flags or making sure that they're delivered and dealt with before closing. That's great. And I, I, I'm i glad that, that you're taking it from a, a place of solutions as opposed to a place of problems. And I, one of the reasons we really like working with you because so many attorneys kind of present a problem with no solution. And so the client will come back to us simply with fear and we have to problem solve and quell the emotion. So we, we really appreciate that approach. Yeah, so thank you. In, in theory, we get to a point where you sign off on the contract and we have due diligence looks good. And at that point, a buyer is pretty much ready to sign. So when a buyer is ready to sign, what does that look like? What's the next step? So once my, once my client is comfortable with the deal terms and that they've been appropriately memorialized in a contract, and they feel comfortable with the due diligence that we've shared with them and that we've discussed and they're ready to sign the only thing that's left is the deposit that we need liquid at the time of contract signing the seller's attorney is going to expect that with a partially signed contract which is signed by the buyers first it is sent over and complemented with the deposit generally speaking we see 10 percent deposits against purchase price that 10% deposit against purchase price is going to be held by the seller's attorney in an IOLA account and credited against the purchase price at the time of closing. It's there to protect the interest of the seller in a transaction that they've entered into with the buyer because they don't want a buyer to get cold feet. They don't want a buyer to change their mind. And so if a buyer were to breach and there was no deposit, then ultimately you're stuck in a lawsuit chasing money or chasing damages. This acts as a way to ensure that the buyer is going to take the steps that they're obligated to take in that contract or under that contract and get to the conclusion, which is the transaction's closing. Otherwise, the seller is going to claim that the buyer is in breach for not living up to the obligations under the contract. And they're going to dangle the threat of keeping that deposit as a result of that breach. Now, it's a discussion for a different panel at another time. It requires a lawsuit. You have to go to court. Nobody wants to go to court when they're transacting. That's why I like this part of the law. I litigated for a very long time. I still find myself litigating, thank goodness, not over my real estate transactions because we avoid those things. But ultimately, most buyers are aware that a lot of money is being held by the other side and they don't want any trouble. So it keeps their feet to the fire. It keeps them working with Melora and the other professionals, which we're gonna get to listen to Christina a little bit, making sure that they have everything in place in a timely fashion so that when it comes time to closing, everything is met within that contract and under those terms. I've, I've often explained it to buyers as the seller's liability is time, whereas the buyer's liability is the deposit, mm -hmm. right? Because the seller has the asset and the seller is taking the risk of saying, yes, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer or Mr. and Mr. We will work with you. Or Mrs. and Mrs. Sure. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, or, or they's and them's. Mm -hmm. So we will work with you. So, you know, th if they're taking that liability and saying, we're going to take it off the market, we're going to enter into a contract and we're going to spend the next 30, 60, 90 days. And that's time and money and, and process and leverage that they otherwise have on the market that they're forfeiting to take a risk that you're the buyer who's going to close. So to match that risk, we do an escrow deposit. Is that a fair way of explaining it? Perfect. Absolutely. Right on. 
So, Jay, you, you send off the wire or however we send off the escrow deposit with a, a partially executed contract. The seller receives it. They countersign it. And we are officially in contract. Is this a time where we open champagne or <laughs> is there still more ahead of us? Not quite yet, as Melora is laughing. She knows that she's been asking behind the scenes and in front of the scenes, Jay, when do you think we're going to have a fully executed contract? Jeff and Aaron, have you heard from Jay today? When are we going to get a fully executed contract? I need a fully executed contract to clear out my file so I can get it over to those that are going to make the decision as to whether or not your client is going to qualify for the financing that I'm trying to get them. Get me that fully executed contract. Right, because I need a drink, Jay. I need a drink. Right. So she'll be popping champagne when she gets the fully executed contract, but we're nowhere near the finish line. But yes, the fully executed contract is imperative to help Melora get you the financing that you need. There will be nothing further discussed unless we have that. So, so it's actually more of a starting point than it is an ending point. Definitely. May I bring in the distinction between what happened before and after? So yeah. what Jay is saying is very important. When you're pre-approved, it's subject to a property. It does not have an address on it. It's not what's known as a real deal. It's just a pre-approval. We have vetted you financially. Financially, you can afford what it is that you're looking to do. It becomes a more serious transaction because now we have a contract with time deadlines and money on the line. And so what Jay is saying is that I really cannot do my thing we cannot do the due diligence on a property. We cannot order the appraisal. We cannot get the homeowner's insurance. We can't satisfy the conditions of the commitment letter until we know that you actually have a property and you cannot secure your interest rate until you have a property because interest rates have expiration dates to them. They're not good indefinitely. So while you're shopping, the market is going to change and the rates are going to change every single day. But once you have that contract and once we know the close date, then we can say, okay, we can lock in because this time frame of this interest rate is long enough to get you to the close date. So this contract is very critical because it starts the due diligence on the property, the praise value, all the legal due diligence, building due diligence. If we need to update any building due diligence, this is the roadmap to get you to keys in your hand. I often say that from fully executed contract to closing, in a co-op especially and with a loan, the 90 days pretty much starts from the contract sign. That's when we start counting roughly 90 days to a closing table. And it, at the same time as we get Melora started on the loan application, send her that contract of sale on the agency side, we begin your board application if you're dealing with a condo or a co-op. Is that why it takes a little longer than a, a single family? Because you're dealing with a board and interview process that's exactly why thanks Aaron. Oh. so <laughs> the the management company is first going to get your board package they're going to review it they're going to send it to the board the board of directors of a co-op or a condo they're just your neighbors right they're not generally like professional board members who are getting paid to do this this yeah. is a volunteer activity this is not their job they have so, four more dots. so they have families. the the interview process which is essential and important to this purchase is going to be at their schedule and at their behest so we are kind of beholden to them in their process and that's why it's such a, a uh, usually such a longer process for a co-op also we can't really begin the board process until you finish that loan application process because generally speaking the board package is going to want to see a commitment letter from the bank they're going to want to see what we call Aztec forms or recognition agreements. They're going to want to know that that loan is pretty much clear to go and just waiting on a board approval. And we need all of that to get completed, including appraisals, et cetera, before we submit a board package. So all of that process, we want to get underway pretty much immediately as we sign a contract. And that way, as soon as we possibly can get your board package submitted, we can get it submitted. Now, again, in a single family or a multifamily home, there is no board package. There is no purchase application, and it's a much simpler process. Instead, we would be talking to somebody to get the title. We would have Christina starting on a homeowner's policy. We'd have Melora working on the loan, and we can close you in probably 30 to 45 days when it comes to a single family or a multifamily home. It's these co-ops and condos where the process is a little bit more labor intensive for everyone involved. 
uh, Melora, you're actually on a co-op board, and you were just at a co-op board meeting before this call. I'm wondering That's if right. you kind of perspective from a board member that you might be able to give when it comes to this board application process. I would just say be thorough. You know, we, we get a lot of board packages that are incomplete that causes calls to delay, and we have to go back and forth a lot, asking for another pay stub, asking for another bank statement, uh, asking for clarification. We just had a board package recently where someone says, oh, they, they're not going to sell this piece of real estate because their mother lives there and the mother handles the expenses. We scrutinize the bank statements. We see everything automatically being debited from the potential tenants shareholders account with no deposit to offset it. So we had to go back and say, show me the money. It's yeah. not declared on their tax returns. What's really going on? So I think the more that everything can get explained up front thoroughly, because we're going to find the holes in the package. We're looking for these things um, because we want to make sure that you're going to be our neighbor. We want to make sure you're going to be a good neighbor. We're going to make sure that you can pay your bills. And we, you know, so, so we're going to, so the, I guess my, I'm repeating myself now, but just the more thorough you can be upfront with explanations and providing a complete board package, you're going to have a much better, much more or streamlined process. And that's a big part of what we try to provide when we work with our buyers. You know, we make, uh, I, I like to think we make beautiful board packages. And part of that is recommending. They are gorgeous. I think so. Part of that is recommending to the buyer that you include a cover letter. Jeff, Not everybody Jeff does. And Aaron, Jeff, Jeff and Aaron are the kids. Remember going to school and you'd have like a report that was due, and like some kids would staple it in the corner, some kids would double staple, and then there was that one kid that would come with like a, like a printed manuscript with plastic <laughs> on top, and it was like yeah, gorgeous. and three ring binder. Yeah, and you're like, what the hell? I can't compete well, with that. It's important, though, because I've, and, and Melora, correct me if I'm wrong, I've said to many clients, if we make it easy on management and the board, they're more likely to just approve it. Absolutely. If you know, you know, we're out. Figure it out and think hard. Now they're annoyed at you at the interview already. We want to make it easy. If you get an interview, because right. here's what's very interesting about a board situation. We review the financials up front and decide at that point if there's going to be an interview or not. And at the, the, the time of interview, it's really mainly to get to know you and to find and just get a sense, tell you what the house rules are, tell you what we expect, tell you, you know, where do you do the recycle and all that. And it's more just to get a feel, is this person going to be a good neighbor or not? You know, so the in-person interview, the finances have already been vetted. So the easier that it's the clearer the roadmap the letters the upfront letter i read every upfront letter why do you want to live here we want to know are you going to be invested with us are you know are do you really want to be in this building or you know do you want to be a good neighbor really i keep going back to that word because we all live very closely together so we really want to know that a we're not going to have any financial trouble and b we're not going to have any personal trouble that you'll follow the rules that the music loud music will stop at 11 <laughs> you know um and i think I'm that's a great thinking any, i'm not thinking anything about being a good neighbor i'm thinking about all state yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's that's really, that's right. screw, exactly. screw the good neighbor that's right you've never been quiet for 40 straight minutes i'm like i know <laughs> that was very proud, very proud of you christina that's amazing you know, I'm like just wait your turn Sean. and you haven't had a sip of coffee it's amazing I, well, because we have to wake up so early tomorrow, so I cut myself off on Tuesdays. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm not, we're caffeinating I'm, right now. Yeah, so, Shaw, tell us a little bit about at what point what, do you want to get involved in this process? When is the right time to call you? Love that question. And y'all are so awesome and inspiring. And I work with a ton of uh, realtors, mortgage bankers and attorneys, and I just love everything you're saying and how we're truly a team. Ideally, I would like to be involved when you execute a contract, if not earlier, especially if you are buying a single or multifamily where um, flood insurance may be required. Um, I like no surprises. 
Um, I have enough gray hair. I don't need more. Okay. Now, does that mean that I get calls from the closing table? Absolutely. And can we execute a policy within 10 minutes? Absolutely. But the reason it's ideal is because somebody like me, I write with multiple companies. A lot of times people don't know that about Allstate. They think, um, the consumer may say it's just on all state paper, but I write with about a dozen or so companies and that benefits you because when I see the rate, I could say, I think I could get you a lower rate without sacrificing coverage with this company. And when time is on our side, I can do that due diligence. I also can educate you without making you an insurance agent on the policy. Not everybody needs certain endorsements, but sometimes you do. Maybe you have jewelry you need to insure. Maybe we have to talk about life insurance. There's just a lot that goes into the conversation. Um, just like you have a contract with Jay, or Jay is executing your contract, you are signing a contract with an insurance company. And a lot of times, people think I'm at the end of the transaction. Somebody on Melora's team says, hey, I need that piece of paper for you to clear to close. And everybody's excited as you should be. Um, and you may think this is just a piece of paper to clear my file. But at the time of claim, should you have to call the insurance company? You want to know that your coverage is going to protect you. And you're going to want to know there's a human on the other side that is going to guide you through the claim. And that's the stuff like we don't want to talk about that all this stuff is really exciting, right? But when that pipe bursts or the tree falls on a home or there's a fire, I'm the person that's going to hold your hand through the process. So the earlier I could speak to you, the better our relationship will be. I love that. And it's, it's true. I find that in our industry it tends to be like the the last checkbox right oh and by the way you need insurance talk talk to christina and and that's kind of how i've treated it in the past as well because you know everything else seems to be a little more tied in with the actual actual execution of the approval of the process but this is just as important well i think before we met christina um insurance was like this gargantuan <laughs> thing that was only available like online you go online you like put in your information you get your quote and you're done yeah. and i think when we met christina and your agency we realized that insurance is actually a very personal thing and having an actual real person is like the greatest thing ever in the history of mankind <laughs> and, i mean it's not too dissimilar from you know the random street easy zillow you know bot that you talk to versus picking up the phone and getting a real agent on the other line yeah and it's, okay. it's the same thing it's the difference between talking to the chat bot versus the real agent and at prices that are competitive or less than the chat box right. um, i always use our competition geico and they do like such an amazing job of branding and letting folks believe like they're the least expensive and price is important, but we've all heard like cheap is expensive, right? So um, a lot of times I am significantly more competitive than these 800 numbers. And so, um, and, and um, I have an expertise in condo and co-op insurance. Um, I was uh, married to somebody for many, many moons that owns a management company. So um, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing that I know so much about condo and co-ops. And that's really important when insuring and talking about how do we write this policy and helping you understand what it is you need. I think that leads into a good question, which is how does a layman kind of understand what they need, you know, and how do, how do you recommend that they familiarize themselves in a way that when they come to you, they're having an educated conversation about it as That's opposed to you just telling them what to do. So um, I have a few home buying guides that if you send me a, a DM on Instagram, I'd be happy to send you. Um, and it's information. 
how to buy home insurance, how to buy condo, co-op, and flood insurance. And it gives you the questions to ask because I find a lot of time, especially first-time home buyers, they don't know what to ask. So for example, a common misconception is if you're taking out a mortgage for $775, we have to insure the home for $775. And th that makes no sense. Because how much does it cost to rebuild the home? Nothing's happening to the land where the home sits. So I don't want you underinsured, but I certainly don't want you overinsured, right? Um, so I will educate the buyer, um, but I do have guides on like, hey, these are questions. So when you do shop, when you call the other companies, these are the questions you should be asking. That was great. Thank you. That's and like, read reviews, right? Like I say, it's self-serving for me to tell you I'm fabulous. I think I'm fabulous. Um, <laughs> but go read what my customers are saying, right? There's 500 plus reviews and my team. And then go read the reviews of the other person. And then and then we can have an intelligent conversation. Absolutely. Yeah. And just as an aside, on a personal note, we were in a car accident. A very, I was in a car accident, a very minor one, about a week and a half ago. And your team has been amazing in helping me manage that. No injuries. Everybody was fine. But I got to deal with the auto body shop and do the claim stuff and file the paperwork and all the blah, blah, blah. And having a real person and knowing that I could shoot you a text message and be like, I'm OK, but was in and of itself a nice thing. And how quickly you got back to me. So, I mean, oh, really yeah. great service. So, for me to to everybody watching, if you do need somebody, uh, Thank please you. Give, you know call. Um, we only have a little bit more time, and I want to kind of quickly jump into a couple of tips about how to win in a bidding war, uh, because that seems to be big questions right now for those buyers who are finding themselves getting outbid, whether it's in the Bronx or in other markets. And I think that if there are some big tips I can give you, the first one, the most important is to be ready to act quickly. You know, one of the things that I love about this whole panel and the, the team that we've mentioned a couple of times tonight is that we're all nimble and able to act quickly. If you need a policy, Christina can get you one in 10, 15 minutes. Of course, it's better if she has some time to do the research and really figure out the best product for you, but she can do it. Same thing with Melora. If I need to get a pre-approval letter from you, she can get that done very quickly. As quickly as you can fill out an application, she can get a letter out. And with Jay's team, I know if I need something, if I can't get him, I have two other people who know what's going on sometimes better than he does. So having the right people on your side is a really important part of this process. And acting fast can be the difference between winning and losing in a bidding war. First impressions are really important. Going in and trying to get a good deal in the middle of a bidding war is usually not a winning strategy. Figuring out a way to show and illustrate that this property is important to you and you want to win can be the big difference. I'm not a huge fan of dear seller letters, the letter that a buyer might write saying, oh, I can imagine pushing little Johnny on the swing. I mean, in some places it's illegal. In some places it is illegal. And I think in most places it's irrelevant. But what I think is important is illustrating in the offer you make how vital it is to you to have this property, how we're able to be flexible. We're able to provide terms at the owner's discretion. We are willing to close at the owner's on the owner's timeline is a great way to show that you have flexibility and you want the owner to pick you. And again, as we said about co-op boards before, make it easy for them. If they have to scour through an, a long paragraph form email to try and figure out what your offer is, they're already frustrated. <laughs> Make it clear, concise, and give them the information that they're going to ask for ahead of time. You're positioning yourself like you're working with a professional. And hire the professional. There's a reason we do this every day. If you're watching this, you're probably not a real estate agent, which means you have a job. You're doing something all day long. We are doing this. We are helping manage the process because while you're at work, I'm calling Christina, I'm calling Melora, I'm calling Jay, I'm calling the other agent, I'm calling the other attorney, and I'm bothering everybody I can to make sure that your transaction is moving forward. That's why you hire the professional, not just to give you the advice, 
but to manage that process while you're living your life. I think we went through a lot of things on this call today and you guys have been awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I just want to remind the buyers on this call that um, even though it might be a scary and uh, weird time buying a, a house for the first time or a condo or, or making any kind of real estate transaction, it should also be a fun time. It should be an exciting time. We should have a good time doing this. And Jeff and I are here to make the process as stress-free as possible uh, so you can find the home of your dreams. We really can't thank all of you enough for joining us, not just our amazing panelists, but those of you watching from wherever you're watching. Uh, I'm gonna give everybody one more shot to, to tell us who you are, what you do. That way we can close out uh, and, and remind everybody that your name's not Oliver and uh, move on from there. So uh, wh why don't we start with the person who's not muted, which is Christina. Oh, but Laura's on muted too. Christina, you start. Sure. And Jay, I always wanted a son named Oliver. So um, I, I enjoy you being Oliver. I'm Christina Shaw. I own an all-state agency on Long Island, though I'm sitting in Westchester. And I would absolutely love you to follow me on Instagram. I'm with Shaw and we can interact and learn from each other there. And thank you for inviting me and giving me an opportunity to help. Thank you. Melora, you want to give us a go? Sure. My, again, my name is Melora Love, and I'm a senior loan officer with Cross Country Mortgage. We're a mortgage brokerage company. We uh, can do everything that banks can do. We have our own line of products for self-employed people. We also have 196 other investors that will do all sorts of crazy things. So one thing that I've loved about this pivot to Cross Country Mortgage is my, my answer used to be, more no's than yeses. And now my answer is always yes. There's always a solution yeah. at Cross Country Mortgage. Love it. All right, Jay. Yeah, so um, I'm Jay Zimner, not <laughs> Oliver Zimner, but I'm I'm proud to be associated with my little Ollie. Um, I have a law firm on Madison Avenue between 49th and 50th. It's a boutique, uh, primarily real estate focused law firm. Um, it's myself and three others. A wonderful paralegal who's been doing it longer than me and two outstanding attorneys who helped me on my buy and sale side depending on which side i'm on and we all work together as a team we collaborate uh, we're there for each other and we're there for our clients and our agents like melora like christina we're problem solvers we don't like to see deals uh get screwed up for any reason that we have control over um and we probably care too much but that's the kind of professional that you want working for you and with you. Someone that cares as much about your deal as they would if it were their own. Um, so I pride myself on that. It's probably kept me in business uh, longer than I otherwise would have been because really we're a dime a dozen. There's lots of real estate attorneys out there, but we're willing to take our agents calls on the weekends. We're willing to get up really early in the morning and stay up really late at night. We know that this is a nerve wracking time as Aaron had mentioned um, just a bit earlier, it's a weird time, but it shouldn't be. It should be stress-free and this should be fun and this should be easy. And so we know that that's a bit of an exaggeration. It's never gonna be stress-free, but it should be fun along with it. And you should enjoy the people you're working with. And I try to be that enjoyable piece to the puzzle if I can. Thank you so much, Jack. Well, we'll close it out. Uh, I'm Aaron. I'm Jeff. And we are the Aaron and Jeff team at Compass, your Bronx residential real estate experts. And uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight. You can follow us on Instagram at Aaron and Jeff. And of course, you can always find us uh, in anywhere you need us. Reach out. <laughs> anywhere. You need me, I'll be there. <laughs> Thanks again, guys, for joining us. And have a thank you, Aaron and Jeff. Great You're the best. Bye. You thank you. Best. Thank you, guys. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.